Und dann sie, a life's full of serendipity, right? And um, as academics, we're always sort of eager to find new problems and, and look at new things. And when Tanzim arrived at Dartmouth, I was really at a crossroads, wondering what to do. And it was just the perfect time for her to arrive. And she has been incredibly influential in my career. And she's a great friend. And I love her son, Zamir, uh, who's a big, Zamir and myself are big, big buddies. Um, we both like garbage trucks. Um, Okay, so um, it's great to be back at Georgia Tech. I, I haven't been here for many years, and I'd like to tell you about a project that Gregory talked about called uh, Student Life Project. And I'll start by um, saying, imagine you are new faculty, and you're teaching your first class at Georgia Tech. And you look out at the sort of sea of fresh faces, Actually, you can tell that this photo is dated, right? Because everyone would be staring at their phones, right? Wouldn't they? Yeah, they wouldn't be interactive. But you look out at this sea of uh, fresh faces and you wonder, who are the students that are going to excel? Who are the students that are going to struggle? And who are the students that are going to drop out? And the answer is, you don't really know. Because many factors can impact academic performance and student life. Consider. Um, the young mother who's returned to college, consider a student who has to deal with bouts of high anxiety, or a first generationer who's trying to navigate through college culture and has no anchor, um, the student who is working an evening job to pay for college and can't deal with the workload. So many factors can sort of influence why a student performs better or worse or actually whilst they would succeed inside, during their college years or not. And it, I'm an old fart, so I won't, I won't even um, say for a moment that I understand students. But when I chat to students, I get a sense that their concerns are grades, um, social life, friends, families, financial concerns, sometimes health issues, um, and navigating the day-to-day -day difficulties of just any college institution. But I believe that with sort of increased academic pressures and um, new, new environments, new social scenes, um, dealing with a new culture can have an impact on academic performance, life on campus, and also can have a, a significant impact on self-esteem. So what happens when life throws you a googly? And I don't mean one of these, which wouldn't be bad if it came with lots of money. I'm actually talking about cricket. Cricket, as you all know, is like baseball, but a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically, a googly is a delivery of a cricket ball by the bowler, by a right-handed spin bowler, actually, where the ball is bowled to devastating effect it has this bounce right before the wicket bounces in. The wickets are those three pieces of sticks in the ground. The bales are on top of that. The ball bounces, swerved in towards the, the wicket, and the umpire does this to the batsman, and he's out. And so why am I talking about cricket? Well, the picture here is of my brother, Ed. And Ed was a great cricket player, actually, but life bowled him one of life's googlies when he was 19 and a student at Durham University in the north of England when Ed suffered from his first depressive episode, which really blindsided him and the whole family, um, and he dropped out of Durham University. And he was later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The good thing is Ed went back to college, went to University College London, uh, King's College London actually, and got a degree in computer science. But his illness had a devastating impact on his life, and even though this was 30 years ago, it got me thinking recently, how can we sort of, there are lots of ads out there. And of course, there's a lot of female ads. Um, I can't think of female name that goes with Ed, but Edwina, fantastic, thank you. Edwinas, Eds and Edwinas out there. So can technology um, assess and intervene to help people in, to help people deal with their illness? And that's, I think, a holy grail that many of us are very much interested in. And you can't really open up a newspaper these days, and doesn't that sound so ac acronistic? Opening up a newspaper. It's really you're clicking on something, right? But you can't open up a newspaper these days without 
reading headlines like this, more college freshmen report having felt depressed. And this is from earlier on this year from Adam Schwartz. And quote, those who felt overwhelmed by schoolwork and other commitments rose to 34% from 27%. So schoolwork and other commitments. And the question is, what is happening on our college campuses? You know, is there really sort of a rise of anxiety and depression, um, mental health issues beyond the norm? Is there something new going on that we don't quite fully understand? Um, and I, I don't really know the answer to that. I don't know if there's enough statistically significant data out there to tell us that one way or another, but it seems to be something is happening. And of course, when we think of the college years, um, the college years, which are long ago for me, but they're years where students experiment, they take risks, they grow up, sometimes they make good choices, good health issue choices, sometimes they make bad choices to cope with stress. For example, they may choose to you know, um, be involved in substance, substance abuse or unsafe sex or um, self-harm um, sort of behavior. Um, so these are sort of important years. And when we think about student health and we think about students, typically student health is not on the sort of top of the list of priorities of students on college campuses. I mean, typically, they are, what, they, what they're concerned about is their grades, their social life, um, could be financial issues, but typically it's not student health. And one important issue that we were chatting about this morning is that the student years are the years where these bad behaviors or these poor choices can have a significant impact on health that's propagated through their lives as, as they grow older, right? And could lead to serious health issues. So locally at Dartmouth College, when I've been chatting to the stakeholders, clinicians, counselors, here is the data from last year at Dartmouth College where 11% of Dartmouth students were diagnosed with depression in 2014, 12% reported depression having an impact on academic performance, and a whopping 28% had seen a mental health counselor in 2014. That means that when I look at the students I teach, a quarter of them, sorry, a third of them, almost a third of them are seeing mental health counsellors. To me, that's shocking. Why is that? Well, it could be they're not, they're not suffering with depression, but having problems with their roommate, right? We don't really know. So the questions that drove the student life study are, why do students burn out, drop, drop classes, do poorly, even drop out of college when other students excel at the same institution? And what is the impact of stress, mood, workload, sociability, sleep, mental health on academic performance. And is there um, a, for, a cycle or a rhythm to the term, a behavioral rhythm that we can observe? By the way, if you have any questions, just put your hand up and, and ask me, and I'm very happy to stop talking. Else, you know, like any other academics, I'll just fill, fill the space right in the air and I'll just keep talking. Um, I would argue that most faculty are unaware of what's going on in their students' lives beyond looking at grades, grades, right? Hopefully, apart from Gregory, most of us are nicer than Professor Snape. I've heard he's a little bit like <laughs> Professor Snape. Some of his students, one of his past PhD students told me that. Um, I won't name any names. But um, at Dartmouth, for example, just after the midterm, we get the white slips. Every faculty gets the white slips, right? And Maybe some students is on probation and we fill in something or we don't fill and we send the white slips back. It sounds so antiquated, doesn't it? Um, so when I started the student life study, because I, I um, taught a basically a 15-week semester system at Columbia and a 10-week um, quarter system at Dartmouth, any faculty actually subjectively knows is as the workload increases, typically the stress will go up and, you know, and students will be sleeping less. Um, but there's really no objective data to verify that. So that was the motivation behind the student life study, um, which we um, did in the spring of 2013, and we published the paper in 2014. And we started with actually 60 students in the study, um, but only 48 made it to the end over 10 weeks. Um, and the breakdown was there was 10 female and 38 male CS students. So a caveat, what I'm going to do, the results I could show you could be completely biased towards computer science students and small Ivy League colleges, right? Yeah? So I'm not, I'm not for one moment saying that these results will generalize out. So for this cohort, at this time, at this college, 
the results that I'll talk about later um, represent um, what we found, the findings. So 30 of them were undergraduates, 18 graduate students, and then there was a breakdown of different types of students, and then we had 23 Caucasians, 23 Asians, and two African-American students in the study. I briefly want to talk about the sensing system that we used, and um, this sensing system was developed with Tanzim Chowdhury over a number of years for different projects. So I have to give credit to Tanzim here. Um, and basically we use sensors on phones, and I know Tanzim hates these sorts of diagrams. She, I'll tell you a secret about Tanzim. When she's reading a technical paper, if she sees a diagram like that, your paper is not going to get accepted in that conference. <laughs> <clears throat> right? Anyway, I'm gonna, I am going to just gloss over this because I know it's going to annoy her. But um, we ran code on the Android phone and we ran code in the cloud. And on the Android phone, we used a bunch of sensors, the accelerometer, microphone, light sensor, GPS, and Bluetooth. And we ran a bunch of classifiers on the phone to do activity, conversational data to look at sleep. Um, we had a number of EMAs or self-reports, EMA, ecological moment assessment. Um, that popped up on the phone to look at issues like stress, mood, um, sociability, exercise, behaviours, and others. And we did a number of pre and post surveys that were mostly mental health surveys. So we collected all this data and pushed it to the back end, and then we did statistical analysis on mental health, academic performance, behavioural term trends, and we developed a number of management scripts, which is the really hard part of running a study, which is keeping students, students being compliant and giving data right. And um, we learned a lot of lessons from doing that. So that's an overview of the student life system. Oh, I should say that we used, for the whole EMA system, we used Google, Google Paco. A very, so we sort of hacked up Google Paco to deliver schedules on EMAs, um, self-reports to students. So the classifiers, very briefly, were, this is all the old hat now, because you know, activity recognition, we enrolled our own to look at sitting, standing, walking, running, cycling, driving car. But the great thing now is it's in iOS and it's in Android, right? So I think that is actually a great, that's great impact but from the Ubicom and different communities that now that's embedded in the operating system. The downside is that Google now know everything about you, right? Yeah, that's, that's the cost of it being in the OS. But we wanted it there, so we have to live with that. Um, and we also looked at um, speech. So we had a two-stage classifier that First of all, could infer voice, and then if a conversation was going on. And it used a hidden Markov model. And basically, we didn't do use speaker ID here, so we just could infer if a student was around conversation, the duration of that conversation, and the frequency, how many of those conversations they had during the day. So it's some approximation of a measure of sociability of a student. And finally, sleep. We inferred sleep. Um, by using simple linear regression, looking at sound, um, light, movement, and the use of the phone, we could infer sleep duration and the onset of sleep within actually, for the student life study, plus or minus 25 minutes. So without you ever, ever interacting with the phone. So you never have to tell the phone, I'm going to sleep now, I'm waking up now, I'm going to sleep with this phone. Because just let me give you an example. I go home at night, there's no cell coverage at my house, so I plug in the phone downstairs by the printer, I have two teenage sons, the house is noisy and there's lights, eventually the house goes to sleep, gets quiet, and it wakes up in the morning, light comes up, noise happens, I come downstairs, grumpy, have some coffee, feel better, get my phone, leave and go to work. So if I put some times on that, you could probably infer how long I slept. So a computer can do a really good job at inferring sleep passively without us ever interacting with it. So that's all, what, what we also had, sleep as well. We also computed Activity duration, that was simply, we looked at accelerometer data and said, over this test 10 minutes period, have we been more active or not? And then we labeled it as an active period. So we used accelerometer data to infer activity duration. And we looked at outdoor and indoor mobility. Since we had all of the access point layout for all of the APs, access points on campus, we knew exactly where the students were indoors, and we knew how mobile they were indoors as well as, as, well as outdoors. And that's particularly important at Dartmouth where it snows basically in you know, it's winter for six months of the year. So students spend a lot of time inside, even though it's the spring term. So how mobile are they inside, how mobile are they outside, important. We had location and co-location. We also did um, EMA, and here we used actually um, PAM, which is the um, photographic affect meter developed at Cornell, 
and it basically uh, pops up on the screen. So a student would, you know, unlock their phone or was working on the phone, and it was annoying. It would come to the front screen on the phone, and it would say, "Touch how you feel right now." And you click on one of those pictures, or there's 48 of them in total, and they correlate with panas, with positive affect. And then after that, an, an EMA would pop up, just one. And uh, here's an example of a single item stress instrument. Right now, I'm feeling a little stressed, definitely stressed, stressed out, feeling good, feeling great. So, PAM would always be uh, combined with an EMA. And these would fire um, throughout the day across the term um, with students. What we also did, and it was a bit sneaky, but the students knew this, was when they actually clicked on how they felt right now, we took a picture of them from the front camera. Because I was interested in how they felt internally, their internal psychological state, and how they looked externally, and was there a difference, right? And I'm showing my pictures here. You can see I'm completely frazzled. Um, that's because I was actually helping run the study and teach at the same time. And actually, I was in the study, but my data's not in the paper, all in the study. And only one student out of all of the students disabled this property, right? So it's quite interesting. We told them that you could get rid of the pictures, you could go in, and, and of course we'd never release those pictures, but we published a workshop paper on face logging, trying to get at, you know, can we actually, because the camera sees you a lot, right, in very poor context, but can we say something about your psychological state from actually using computer vision techniques? And the answer basically is no. We can't do that right now. Uh, but maybe cameras are getting better, so we might be able to do it. So we actually had 32,000 EMAs and over 9,000 um, face log images in the data set. And uh, we also, in addition to that, we did pre and post mental health surveys. Um, and I should say, by the way, this study, um, well, whilst I sort of led the study, it was a whole cohort of people that helped design the study, including clinicians, psychologists, computer scientists, Tanzine was one, who actually decided on you know, what were, what were the questions we were interested in? What were the surveys that we wanted to actually use? Um, so one of the surveys was PHQ-9 that measures depression scale, right? And so there's, you know, there's some basically really scary questions that are to do with suicide ideation here, or, you know, over the last two weeks, have you expressed a little interest or pleasure in doing things? And this gets scored, and these are the scores for the pre and post of our, our cohort. And you can even see that for this small group, there were a number of students in the moderate, moderately severe and severe um, categories of, of the scale, and this is the scoring. And it changes a bit between the beginning and end of term. But when I showed this to a clinician on camera, she's like, oh no, this is not very good. No, she was actually surprised at the, the high level of, um, of depression in this small, small cohort. So we, we did um, a number of different questionnaires. Um, we did um, depression scale. We did the perceived stress, st press, perceived stress scale. I haven't had my coffee this morning. <laughs> Gregory, when we had a meeting, he was putting up the agenda for the meeting we had, and he neglected to say coffee break or coffee. Thought about it. Yeah. Um, but so you blame Greg. I've got, I've, got, I've got sweet tea here. I'll, I'll, I'll get amped up on sugar. Um, so we also um, had the students do the perceived stress scale. And the loneliness scale, um, and also flourishing. Flourishing is a sense of um, optimism about your future or about relationships. Um, so that's, that's what flourishing is. They also did the big five personality. So all the students filled in the surveys pre and post. The study design was that we recruited students and we sort of incentivized them, aka bribed them to actually be in the study, not to be in the study, but if they were in the study, they got a t-shirt, it's amazing what a t-shirt can do. And every three weeks we sort of raffled off um, five, six jawbone ups to the top collectors in the study. And by top collectors, um, we mean in terms of the passive sensing data that has no overhead to be collected. All you've got to do is bring your phone with you, plug it in at night, and the EMA data where it is really annoying and novelty effect wears off and students stop answering those EMAs, even though we got a considerable amount of EMAs from this group. And then at the end of the study, we gave out, we, we used um, the Nexus, t Nexus 4s here. We gave four, we gave 10 Nexus Android phones to 10, or ra 10 students randomly, randomly selected from the top 30 collectors. So there was some sort of merchandise and goodies that they could get for participation. Um, we had an orientation session where they read and signed the consent form. They did the uh, mental health surveys. 
We ran the study for 10 weeks. Um, we interacted with the students if we noticed that their participation or data was dropping for whatever reason. And um, then we had the exit, exit interview and um, the exit surveys and, and the, and the post-mental um, health surveys. And of course, we had access to their transcripts as well, so how well they did in all their classes. Um, so now I want to talk about the data set. The data set is actually being publicly released, and that was really important to me for this project. And I must say, I waited till all the students had graduated from Dartmouth to release this because it, you know, there's a lot of important data in this anonymized data set. And I know if there's privacy, are there any privacy people, security people in the room? Because if they are, they can leave. Um, no, I'm only joking. But I'll just, I'm, just, I'm just building up a bit of you know, strength to answer some questions later. Um, so the data set actually includes um, 53 gigabytes of sensing data, 32,000 EMAs, 48 pre and post surveys, um, a, lot, a lot of passive sensing data that has no overhead to collect, um, the EMA data, um, the pre and post surveys, um, the transcripts, we do have actually other data such as Facebook that's not released. We do release their dining data. So every time they had a meal, we also were able to collect that data as well. Um, so we looked at sort of eating habits and things like that. Um, and then we have the exit interviews, but we didn't release those as well. Seating data. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yes, seating data. So, so what, what we did do was in my class, because my class was the common um, class for all of these students, where they sat in, I was interested in where they moved around as the term went on. You know, did they sit at the front and move back as their grade was dropping off or whatever. So we have their seating information as well in the class. Um, so the, this um, data set is publicly available and a number of people started using it. I'm very excited that people are using it um, because they'll discover things that we haven't discovered, hopefully. So now I want to sort of turn to talking about some results. And um, first thing, do students have their own clock? And the answer is at Dartmouth they do. Um, and I'll justify that by showing you this, which will mean nothing to you. Well, Tanzine's getting sort of worried now because she, she knows what this is. This is actually the um, timetable for all Dartmouth classes. And I don't know what happens at Georgia Tech, but we, give, we have numbers, for example, I, this particular term I taught in the 10 slot, which was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, from 10 to 11.05, with an extra X hour um, at, on Thursday between 12 and 12.50. So faculty sit, and students talk to themselves about slot numbers. So this is actually the, the, the timetable. This is actually dynamically created from location data. And this shows the timetable of all those students across the whole term. And the whiter it is, the more students in the cohort were in that slot. So you can see my class really sort of sticks out here, right? And uh, that's good. And then all, these are all the, they took um, classes from 19 other different departments, because it's a liberal arts college, right? And they typically started, so the darker it gets, the fewer students that were in those slots. But their, their day basically is from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. So we, de we define that as the day epoch. This is all their night data. This is the onset when they go to bed for all the students averaged across the term. And you can see some students do go to bed before 12, but most of them go to bed between 12 and 3. And then we've got these vampires down here <laughs> that go to bed, you know, 3, 4, 5, 6, and some that don't go to bed at all, just purely live on adrenaline and caffeine. And so we said that the night period is between 12 and 9 a.m. And then finally, we said everything was left over, we called it the evening. So these epochs, as we call them, become important when we're actually looking at the data to try to find trends and patterns within, these, within their clock, right? And uh, we do find things. This slide shows aggregate data. And I always get a bit embarrassed when I show this slide because I have really nothing to say about it. Um, but this shows... Um, a bunch of sensing data for across the epoch, so the day, the evening, and night. So this is how active they are. So they are active for about an hour during the day, about half an hour in the evening, and 13 minutes at night, on average. Um, this is the conversation duration, the conversation frequency. Because there's two numbers here, 165, 165 minutes, um, 133 minutes. 
this is with their classes. Because we know when they're in class, when they're attending class, we remove the conversation information data because it's nothing to do with sociability. It's to do with me you know, teaching students, right? So this is with and without the uh, lectures. So they basically have like, um, you know, two hours of conversation duration during the day period, about an hour in the evening and 30 minutes in, in, at night. And they have about 13 conversations during the day, 10 at night, and four in the evening. I have nothing to compare these to. So you know, I don't really understand if it's good or bad or whatever. If you look at individual differences, then you could say things. But that's some of the data. Um, in terms of mental health, I'll show you a few results. So one of the things that I think is really cool about what we did was we used passive sensing data to um, find correlations with depression scale that are sort of known in the psychology and medical literature already. But this data has come from passive objective sensing data on the phone. It's nothing to do with filling out a survey here, right? And so what we found was the most strongly correlated metric associated with depression is that the fewer conversations a student had during the day period, the more likely they were to be depressed. So this is a, this is a strong correlation, and it's very statistically very significant. Um, we also found that students who slept less were more likely to be depressed, which is a, a known, known in the literature. And similarly found sort of conversation frequency in the evening to be a strong correlate as well, as well as a number of co-locations. In terms of loneliness, we um, found that activity and mobility were the key correlates to loneliness. And uh, we found that students that were less active were more likely to be lonely. Um, and students who were less mobile indoors and outdoors during the day period were more likely to be lonely. But this activity duration, the most strongest result that we got was the activity duration during the evening period was the most significant and strongest correlation. And when I showed these results, when I saw this result, I'm like, wow, there's something missing here. Does anybody know? What's mis what, what would, with loneliness, what you would expect to see here? Conversation. Conversation. <laughs> and when I showed this to Kat Norris, who studies loneliness, she goes, of course. Your assumption is somebody who is lonely you know, is not interacting with people. But there could be somebody who's extremely social and has lots of conversational interactions with people that actually feels abject loneliness. Right? So that really was an eye-opener to me. Um, in terms of um, stress, we found that the most significant correlation, again, was conversation frequency during the day. So the fewer conversations that a student had during the day, the more likely that they were stressed. And these are correlations, again, with the survey. So we're cor what we're doing here is we're correlating passive sensing data or inferences from the phone with the ground truth medical mental health surveys here. And so we find, again, that conversation frequency um, and conversation duration relate strongly to stress, as well as sleep. So the less you're sleeping, the more likely you're to be stressed, which is some of these things are a sort of no, um, no brainer or they're in the literature. But again, I like to say the contribution here is it's passive sensing data from a phone that is driving these correlations and not sitting down in an interview with a clinician or psychologist, right? Um, I'm now going to switch to sort of maybe more light-hearted um, results, but I think they're pretty fascinating. Um, behavioral trends. Now I'm going to show you um, the same plot over and over. I'm going to show you about six plots. They're all going to have the number of days in the actual study, the midterm period, which is about two weeks at Dartmouth, and this is the workload. So we collected all of the assignments the students had in my class and the other two classes they had. And this, we said this represents workload. We didn't say, oh, my assignments are tougher than another professor's assignments, therefore they should be weighted. We just used a number here. So this, is, this blue line you'll see on all the plots represents deadlines that they're actually trying to respond to. So you can see they come back from um, spring break. And for the first week and a half, they don't sleep very much. You'll see some later data in a moment. You'll see what they're doing. Um, then they get some sleep, and then towards the midterm, they're sleep. So this is, the, this is continuous sensing data again, sleep inferencing um, duration. Um, you see their sleep drops off through the midterm period. And then 
For some reason, the workload in all these classes drops. They get some sleep, and then the, mid, the finals happen, and they stop sleeping. So you're uh, measuring, when you talk about these deadlines, the amount of work. No. If I have a project that's due, it's a huge... Yeah, we're not measuring that. We're not measuring that. It would be great if we could measure that, because we could weight that curve differently. Right. Um, this, to me, is perhaps the most... Question. What, so it's 0.1133 sleep? What does that mean? Yeah, don't worry. He, I'm a scientist. Don't worry about the axis. I know, you, I, know, I know that's an uncool thing to say, but they're normalized. So, you know, over here we've got the number of deadlines, and over here, just take it as, as something to do with sleep. Um, so again, forget about these. Don't, don't, get, don't get concerned about these axes here. I know, I'm being terrible here. I'm giving bad examples to students. But this, to me, is one of the most fascinating curves. This shows the actual, again, shows the workload and shows the conversation duration and conversation frequency. So the number of conversations on average the students are having and their duration across the whole term. You can see they come back from spring break and they're having longer but fewer conversations. I would claim, but I don't know, that these are, this is social conversations. They've just come back, they've been in some great place, they're catching up, right? And as we move towards the midterm, we get this inflection point where now they're actually having more shorter conversations. These are, I'm freaking stressed out, leave me alone. <laughs> right, how are you doing? Fine, how are you? Move on, right? I don't know, but I suspect that these are more business-like interactions. And then it sort of drops off um, here, and then it improves towards the end of term where they're having longer, uh, more frequent, so potentially social interactions again. So I think this is like a fascinating curve. Um, in terms of activity, they come back from spring break and they're active until midterm, and then it sort of flat, flattens out. Um, stress, so this is actually EMA data here. And I, I really wish I could give this to the president of our university and they could redesign the curriculum based on this. But they come back from spring break feeling really good about themselves, this is affect, and they actually have no stress at all. <laughs> they hit the midterm, they sort of peak out on stress, it remains that way through the term. By the end of term, they feel absolutely lousy about themselves. Right? They go to the gym until midterms. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking great until midterms, and then oh. that's it, it's gone. <laughs> so, in terms of academic performance, um, one result that I actually didn't want to share with my chair or dean was that we found. This is actually the attendance rate. So you can see the attendance rate sort of drops off as the semester progresses. Is this your class? Uh, I'd like to say that, but it's not. Um, so how did you get that? So how do we get attendance rates? So if you remember back to when I showed you the timetable, we know all the classes they're in purely based on their location, right? And so we can you know, account for attendance. Um, as long as they didn't forget their phone. As long as they didn't forget the phone, yeah. And, uh, and if they forgot their phone, they got an email from Ray because Ray was monitoring them, and saying, hey, you left your phone in the dorm, right? Go get it. Um, so, you know, so here attendance drops off during the term, but the result that we found, we found no correlation between class attendance and academic performance, which I decided not to pass up the chain of command, <laughs> um, since my next salary rise would be, you know, um, minimal. Um, so got to ask, well, why is this the case? Why is this the case? And we looked at the data a little bit more deeply, and we looked at individual differences between the high and low performers, as well as we looked at sort of higher level behaviors to do with studying and partying, and we did a time series analysis to try to track behavioral changes, rather than looking at correlations and averages. Um, and whilst I won't go into the details here, I want to give sort of some motivation here. So, What's really important is, even if your sensors have errors, right? Even if your sensors have errors, what's really important, I believe, is the change in behavior, right? So if somebody is social and then isolated, then that may be an important change, right? Or if someone's sleep patterns radically change, that might be an important change. So change is really important when you're actually doing data analysis here. So imagine that this is the whole term again, and this could be, for example, sleep. So now we, what we do is we look at the term slope. And we say that this is a negative slope for sleep for this student across the term. And we also said that the midterm is a significant anchor point in the term. So what's happening before and after the midterm may be important. So we describe um, 
features called pre and post slopes. Um, in this case, this is a positive slope to do with sleep, and this is a negative slope to do with sleep after, before and after the midterm. And finally, students respond to changes in their life by enacting change. And the big question is, when does that happen? Right? And so we actually um, analyze what we call breakpoints, behavioral breakpoints, where, for example, this could be conversational data, where it could be conversation duration, where suddenly a student drops off their conversation interaction and sociability. So we describe this as a breakpoint. So now we have a lot more features to do with epochs and behavioral change associated with these behaviors, a richer class of data to try to mine to find out more about um, academic performance. Um, we went about trying to study, trying to infer studying. And we got lucky at Dartmouth, and I'll explain that in a minute. But not only did we try to infer studying, but we tried to infer focus studying. So if a student's actually in a study, is studying and focused on the task. And the way we did that is that Dartmouth's an unusual place where it's really an enclosed campus. All the students live on campus, particularly undergraduates. They all socialize on campus. Very tight-knit community in really sort of a small New England town. It's fairly, it is fairly isolated and fairly rural. Um, and many of the students, the vast majority of students, actually study in groups or individually in study areas. And there are many really great study areas at Dartmouth that range from you know, quiet library spaces to private rooms to cafes that are open all hours and students work and socialize in these spaces. So we use the semantics of place to label all these study areas. And then we said, our heuristic was, we said that if a student was in a study area for greater than, um, this could be open to criticism, for greater than 20 minutes, and we weighted what we call studying, then we said that the student's studying, and we said, if the ambient noise around them was quiet and they were not moving around in the study area, looking at accelerometer data, or looking at the lock and lock of their phone or interacting with their phone, we said that was focus study, right? And now when we look at the study data and we look at the, um, we look at the attrition in class in terms of attendance across the term, what we see is sort of a rise in self-study to the midterm, this sort of drop, and then after the midterm where actually attendance drops off, we see this equally interesting rise in self-studying. And this could be Dartmouth students dealing and coping with stress and low, we don't know because there's no cause and effect here, but that's one plot with studying. Partying. We also looked at that Dartmouth, which has got a reputation as being a hard party college. Um, I don't know about this because I'm just a boring old professor <coughs> who doesn't party at all, listens to bebop jazz. Um, but partying, how do we do partying? Well, at Dartmouth, all the parties are in the, sadly, are in the basement of the fraternities. And they're all open to all, it's mostly all the undergrads, it's open to all the undergrads on campus. And the reason why they are amazingly popular is because that's where all the illegal drinking is done, and probably illegal drugs, right? Is done in the basement of these um, fraternities. So we used a similar approach to actually infer partying. If a student was in one of these fraternities, and, and we also knew if the student happened to live there, right? right? But if they were in the fraternities for a certain period of time, and because most of these parties are dance parties, and look, looked in at, at sound, weighted with sound and activity, we inferred party. So when do the students party, and when do the students study? And when I show this data to Dartmouth undergraduates, what happens is this smile breaks out on their face which to me might not be like scientific validation, but I've talked to enough of them <laughs> to know that this is true. And it's really weird, and it's really Dartmouth. The biggest party night is Wednesday. What a losing campus, eh? <laughs> I mean, for me, when I was growing, it was always Friday, right? But at Dartmouth, it's Wednesday. And do you know why? Because the Greek houses have their meeting night, AKA illegal drinking and drinking, right? So that is the biggest party night on Dartmouth campus. And it traditionally has always been that way. And the administration actually supports this because classes start at 8 o'clock every day apart from Thursday when they start at 10. And, <laughs> and our new president, who's so embarrassed by this and because of all the bad press that Dartmouth's had, he has now reverted to class starting at 8 o'clock on Thursday morning, which is very unpopular. 
Um, so Wednesday's the big party night, but also Friday and Saturday and Thursday, and then not much happening Sunday and Monday or Tuesday. If you look at the studying behavior, it's the absolute opposite. And really, studying is setting up for the party week. You can see it here, right? Sunday, quite a lot of studying going on. Monday, big study night, big study day. Tuesday, the biggest study day of the week. This is average across all the days across, all the, ter across the term. Wednesday, still studying because party start, 9, 10, right? Nothing going on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then getting back into the working week again. And if we look at the partying across the term, we can see that the first two weeks are the most party, partying. That's when, why they're not sleeping, right? Because all the parties are going, if you re remember back to the sleeping data. And then it sort of drops off through the midterm, peaks again during, this is um, Green Key, which is our spring festival, which runs from Wednesday to Sunday, while partying going on and then drops off. Um, I begin, I'm going to actually begin to sort of wrap up here. So coming back to what correlates with academic performance? Well, we found that activity. So if students um, were less active after the midterm, so this says activity post slope, which would be me meaningless to you, so I'm just going to interpret it. So if students are less active after the midterm period, they were more likely to have a better GPA. If students change their conversational behavior, particularly the duration, after the midterm period, particularly in the evening, they were having less conversations, they had higher GPAs. Students who were um, less mobile as the term went on indoors had higher GPAs. Thank goodness. Students who actually attended class, pre-slope, meaning they attended class, but increasingly attended class up to the midterm period, also seemed to do better. Students who um, partied less as the term went on did better. Students who studied more, surprise to surprise, did better. And students who had focus study also did better. So my question to you is, do you think, um, of course this is a loaded question, else I wouldn't ask it. Do you think a smartphone can predict GPA? Hands in the air who think a smartphone can predict GPA. All right, we've got like, about a quarter of the group. So let's see. What if you can know someone's GPA just by simply looking at their phone? I love this guy. I love him. Many factors affect academic performance. Studying, physical activity, socializing, and sleep. At Dartmouth College, we have developed the very first app that uses sensing and machine learning algorithms to automatically track all of these activities behind the scenes. No user input. At the end of a semester, by using this data along with periodic self-reports, our app can predict your GPA at 1700 of a point. You see, the app mines the relationships between these student behaviors and builds a computational model in the cloud to predict your GPA. So, what factors were most predictive? First, higher performers experienced an increase in stress levels up to the midterm period, followed by a gradual decrease to the end of the term. Second, in terms of sociability, high performers had shorter conversations during the evening and night periods later in the term. Third, as the term proceeded, the high performers spent more time studying. Fourth, the high performers were more conscientious. And finally, high performers had higher levels of positive affect at the end of the term <coughs> compared to low performers. Imagine a world where a student simply checks their phone to see if their behavior is in sync with their desired GPA. If not, the phone provides tips on how to get back on track. That's the future we're working on here at Darwin College. For more details on the Smart GPA app and its predictive modeling, check out our technical paper on the Student Life Book. I love that guy. Is the midterm exam uh, score will affect the behavior after the midterm exam? Because for like uh, they have less stress in the in the after midterm uh, period might, might be caused by because they have a higher grade in the midterm. 
Right, it's a good point. So, you know, how does the mid, how does the results from actually any assignment or midterm impact any of these behaviours, right? And um, we didn't specifically look at the midterms. That's a good. We didn't take the midterm and then do analysis round. But that's that's a good question. Um, I got to apologise for Matt, the student who did the video. He's a very cheesy part at the end there, but you got to love him. He's he's gonna he's got a career in, in Hollywood, that, that fella. So let me wrap up because I know we don't have too much time. Um, I, I teased you with the smart GPA stuff. If you're interested in um, how we actually did that, um, we built a predictive model based on a large number of features um, to predict GPA of just the undergraduates in this cohort, um, because only undergraduates actually have a GPA at Dartmouth, graduate students don't. Um, there's a, a paper in, in um, Ubicom, and the Student Life paper is also published in Ubicom last year for people interested in the sort of technical details. Um, so why are these results important? I believe they're important because I think you know, many of us who are working on sort of um, automatic or passive sensing realize that right now is really the first time that we've been able to actually do 24-7 passive sensing without destroying the phone's um, performance in terms of its battery. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a similar evolution for wearables that are not, I believe, not capable of doing the same thing we can do with phones right now, but in the future they will be able to do that. And I think they're also important because we actually used um, objective sensing data from a phone without the user's input to find correlations with gold standard mental health surveys. Um, whilst we couldn't sort of predict mental health, we actually found results that basically complemented what we know from the from medical and psychological literature, but the breakthrough here is that the phone itself provided the data. Um, so what are we interested in in the future? Um, like many people, we're interested in trying to predict depression, which is a really hard problem, and there are a number of people working on it, and a number of companies um, looking at this as well. Um, and also, what are the new forms of intervention that we can do by considering not just the student, but the stakeholders around the student, but always giving the control to the student in terms of um, how they, they want to share their data? I'll give one anecdote here um, that I write about in the paper that I don't go into too much details because it's of the IRB, but I had, all, I had access to all of the data for all of the students, right? And I also noticed that two students were not coming to class, didn't submit programming assignments, and they just dropped off the face of the earth. <clears throat> and typically as a professor, I would have to give the, those students, I had to fail those students. Instead of failing those students, I gave those two students um, incompletes, which allows the student to come back and complete the course. Um, those students had the other two classes they took, they, got fail they, got, they, got, they failed. At Dartmouth, if you get three, if you fail three classes in one term, you automatically have to leave campus for a term. And so by the fact I had access to this information and, and understood what was going on, and I could talk to maybe one or two of you privately a little bit about what those students were doing, one of those students was actually giving us the most EMA of any student. He was just living in his dorm, right? Um, so there's a, a, a simple example how an intervention could enable a student not to fail and, you know, and spend a term at home with their parents, right? Which might be good for them, actually, but I don't know. But different types of intervention. Um, this work, by the way, I, I am just the mouthpiece here because um, um, Ray, Ray Wang, can you put your hand up, Ray? He's a really quiet guy. There he is. And Gabriella um, actually were two students, actually did a lot of the work. Ray should actually be up here giving this talk. And of course, a number of people both um, influenced how this study was set up. Um, as I said, they're sort of clinicians, computer scientists, personality psychologists, social scientists, people interested in loneliness. Of course, instrumental in this is Tanzine Chowdhury. This study would never have happened without my sort of uh, close collaboration with Tanzine. The technologies that were used in student life essentially came out of joint work between the two of us. So I'm very grateful to Tanzine for that. Um, this is a growing area of research. Um, we had a workshop in July, and you can find this on the web, called College Student Health. There's some, we collect with this video of all, this, all the breakout sessions, some eerily, and all the white papers are there. If you're interested in this emerging field, please go and look at that. Um, so finally, in summary, so what happens when life throws you a googly? 
I hope mobile will detect it and mobile will deflect it. So thank you very much. Right. So we, we you know, it, it's, it's fairly easy. I mean, classifiers can always get confused, right? That's why I have the confusion metrics. But, you know, that would be an un unknown state, just twiddling with your phone like that. I mean, maybe it could get confused with running or walking, but um, it would be fairly straightforward to be able to, you know, remove those sorts of patterns. So you think so? Sort of anomalies like that are, in your experience, reasonably easy to well, I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're rare, and I wouldn't say they're easy to detect, but I think you, there, there's a, a method by which I think we could apply to actually remove those. Yeah. So uh, what are the most surprising results are you finding after you look at data? And some of the results you may never saw before you collect data. Right. Actually, this was a criticism of the paper that, you know, when we submitted the papers, like, oh, this is great work, but there's nothing really surprising here. And I don't think there's anything, one thing that really surprised me. The things that I sort of take away from doing the student life study was um, sort of anecdotal things were, the, the, first of all, the sort of the level of difficulty that goes into actually running and maintaining a study and getting good, good data and trying to, you know, deal with compliance. You know, that's fairly boring. Sounds like engineering. But I, I didn't realize that going into So I'd never really done a study like this before. And many people in HCI do that all the time, but it was really a surprise to me. Um, I, you know, the reward that I got out of it was actually um, enabling these two students to come back to campus. And one of them actually came to see me in my office um, in the fall when they came back. And, you know, we talked about the work that he had to, to do, you know, to, to complete the class. And he never, ever mentioned once about what was happening with him. Nor did I ever, ever ask. You know, so I learned to, you know, keep a distance between what's happening in a student's life and, and my interest in finding. I was very interested in getting information from him, but I would never ask him that, nor did he want to give that information. But that student went on to graduate, and now, you know, I sort of know he has a job, a job in Silicon Valley, he's doing well. That's sort of rewarding, so that was a sort of ad hoc intervention. In terms of actually the results that we got, um, in terms of the correlations, I would say that I was, I was pleased to see that the conversational aspect to behavior seems so important in a, in, a, in a student group. And that sort of surprised me. I assume from what you described, <coughs> students didn't have access to any of this data during the collection. Oh, you're right. Thanks. So, so do you Thanks think for up. what value might there be to providing a reflective piece of this during, uh, or, or while it's being collected? Right. So I should have said that. I'm like, I should have said that at the beginning. That we purely collected data here. There was no feedback to students, right? And so that's really hard if you're in the business of data collection. We talked about this this morning, what is the incentive, what is the value for a, a student to actually allow you to put that software on their phone, right? Um, so that's, one, that's an open question, um, Gregory. I think, you know, Tanzim and myself did some work on Be Well a few years ago where we looked at, that's, you know, we, we just took ideas that have been around in the Ubicom community using ambient screens on phones and, and stuff like that. And so the, I think the thing is, how do you find the channel to a student, right? And what is their channel? You know, so if you want them to reflect on the data, I mean, if they're, if they're self-quantified nuts, they'll be geeky and look at the data using MATLAB, right? Yeah? Um, if they really are, if they're really into that, right? But when I think of my brother, okay, he was a computer science person, but you know, how would I get to Ed if he was at Georgia Tech now? who wasn't necessarily a computer science person. What is the channel into that student and what piece of data may they reflect on? I think it's a really, it's an open question 
Um, and it's a hard question. Well, just to speculate, you had them while they're turning on their phone pick a picture that most describes them. <laughs> yeah. And those pictures are associated with certain kinds of affect, right. mood level. Right. Well, instead of doing a follow up survey, you could say something, you know, over the past week, 13 times you have selected something that suggests yeah. you're really happy right. or really upset. Why? And that's it. Well, no, right. not even why. Just yeah. You, you just quickly flash that up, and they may look at it, they may not. So you reinforce a feeling that they may or may not have had, right? right. So they can reflect on it. So I, would, I said that, that's a good idea. We never got into that business with student life. I think it's an important part of it. I should say, because the one thing at the exit, in, the exit interview, students actually hated all the MAs. And I'm going to embarrass Gabriella's advisor, Sam Gosling, who's a brilliant guy, I love him a lot. Sam came up with an EMA and had like 20 questions on. So this was a pop-up questionnaire for the phone. You know, clearly Sam is not a mobile guy. Well, he is, but you know, I was like, let's cut it down. They hated the behavioral one more than any, simply because it had the most questions. But they loved Pam. They absolutely adored Pam. Um, and there's something posit very positive reinforcing about clicking a picture, I think, that sort of interaction rather than filling in a textual input. So I think what when, that's a great question. I think when I, when I listen to your question, I, I naturally think of what are the coping skills that students have in dealing with stressful events in their lives, right? And again, we really don't know. We could, we could hypothesize, we could guess, we could interview a few students, but it, there may be a huge amount of individual variability. Stress, yeah. Around midterm, it's going to jump for some Yeah. Not as high for others. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, another good point. We didn't look at that, and the data sets there. So somebody could look at that individual variability, how stress and, and the other behaviours relate. Um, you know, when I when I talk to um, when I talk to the clinicians at Dartmouth, the one thing that, that they bang on about, and it, you know, I'm not sure if students ever listen to them because you know students at these very competitive places like Georgia Tech, I'm sure it's exactly the same here. I get in line for my cup of coffee in the morning on campus, and all I hear about is the all-nighters they pulled and how stressful they are, and they wear that as a badge of honor, right? Yeah. So how do we actually get them to sleep more and be less stressed when they think actually sleeping less is good and being stressed is okay? So you know, there's many sort of open issues there to tap into these young people and try to understand how, you know, how they could, you know, tell you, get six, eight hours sleep tonight. You're going to deal with your stressful event tomorrow so much better. We've got the literature. We've got the literature to show it, but sorry, it's difficult to influence them. Thank you for all your questions. Yeah, thanks again, Dan. Thank you. So, in case you don't know it, at 3...